everybody. Welcome to church. We got about five minutes before the service starts, so here are some church appropriate dance moves you can do whenever the spirit moves you. So get on up and let's sweat to some scriptures. Or maybe not. Or just, just let's go. Here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Shirts on the face. See it on the face. Yeah. Bring it together. Here we go. Let it go. You take the stone. You let it go. You're unhindered by armor. Let that elbow sway. Elbow. 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 Okay. One of my personal favorites. Resurrection. You gotta get down to get back. Yeah. Keep working, you guys. Keep working. You're doing great. I'm doing great. I'm getting a little tired. Crush it. Crush it. Get it. Crush it. Crush it. We gotta stomp hard. Stomp hard. Stomp hard. You're crushing it. Crushing it. Crushing it.
Christ in the church. Try not to sing this song. Yeah.
you know, every time I see the rainbow in the windows mm -hmm. and where people are writing Ça va bien aller, yeah. I think about that verse that says that God works all mm -hmm. things for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Yeah. So every time I see that, yeah. it's all going to be all right. I'm like, amen. Yeah. Yes, it is. God works all mm -hmm all things for good and that is i mean i'm like i love it yeah. when the city and everyone so i put a huge rainbow on my my window to just be, i want to be a part of that you know that light and that movement in our city yeah. that is uh, that's really pointing to the truth of God yeah. Yeah. that we know that he is in control yes. and that he is working mm -hmm. all things out yeah. behind the scenes <laughs> Oh, I'm so excited about this next song. Are y'all ready? Yeah. Ready to sing another song? Yeah. Woo!
Hey guys, welcome back to yes. City Church. Or if it's your, it's your first time here, hey, welcome home to City Church. I'm Chris, the lead pastor of City Church, and here is the incredible Leah, our next generation director. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> now, Chris, with it being kind of still, we're September, kind of kids are coming back to school. What was your favorite part growing up of going back to school in September? What did you love most about that? Man, that's a great question. You know, as a, I gotta tell you, as an active young guy, I didn't love going back to school. But what I did love is that smell of the new backpack and the brand new shoes. You only got new yes. shoes once a year, and that was a big day. <laughs> so true. Yeah, I'd agree. You know, I love like opening all my like, brand new school supplies, and I'm weird, I would label all of my like pencils and stuff, but to. I don't want people to take them, you know? So they looked good. So, hey, City Church, let us know what your favorite part of going back to school was as a kid, or right now, what do you love most about going back to school? I love that question. <laughs> hey guys, we are so excited because last week, actually on Tuesday, we yeah. launched our M514 <laughs> Alpha, Youth Alpha, yeah. just for our high school students. M514 is a, the partnership between parents and students to, to bring up the next generation. And so as a parent, my greatest desire, and I know Leah's greatest desire, is for us to pass the baton of faith to the next generation. And one of the great tools that we've discovered, even in this last few months, is Alpha. Yeah. And it's designed especially for our youth. So mm -hmm. Leah, tell us a little bit more about how they can get involved and what Alpha is all about. Yeah, so we were so excited to launch Youth Alpha for the first time at City Church just this past week. And so the cool thing about Alpha though, we know high school is busy, so teens, if you missed last week, start this week. It's an awesome opportunity to just learn the basics of Christianity or learn more about it. Like even when I went through the course this past spring, I learned so much for myself. And I know you were saying the same thing for yourself. Absolutely. And I think the great thing about doing it online is just like we saw, we were able to see someone from Washington, D.C. We had a young lady from Vancouver. We had a couple of people from Ottawa. We had someone from Iran and all over Montreal. So it truly was like a United Nations yeah. experiment. And I think one of the great things that we can empower our parents and our students to do is to go online themselves, but also to invite a friend. Yeah, seriously. So teens, invite friends, and we're gonna let you more a little know a little more about that in a minute, but first, watch this video. Okay, you rolling? Okay, we're gonna scare Jason with this spider. Come on, we're gonna get him back. Watch it. Guys, this is a film set, you got it. Oh, spider! Tons of things happen in our lives every day. And in a 24 hour period, we ask ourselves so many different questions. Like, what should I eat? What should I wear? Or who should I hang out with? Sometimes we ask bigger questions like, what do I wanna be when I grow up? Who will I marry? Or where will I live? But every once in a while, we ask ourselves those even bigger questions. Questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And is there more to life than this? The reality is, there aren't a lot of places we can go to explore life's biggest questions. So on Alpha, we want to create a space where we can talk about those kind of questions in a way that's open and honest. In each one of our hearts, it's like we have a happiness bucket that we're constantly trying to fill. It can sound like this. If I just had uh, more money or nicer clothes or a new girlfriend, then I'd be happy. The nights would come and the girls would be gone. Like, they'd be just me, you know, me and I guess God, right? And I'm like, okay, there's definitely more to life than this. Like, I just want, I want, I want, I want, and you don't get anything. There's this deeper, even spiritual hunger that we're all trying to satisfy. As someone who grew up in an atheistic home, I wasn't just gonna accept what he was gonna say. So I was like, okay, did this actually happen historically? What's the evidence? I'm not gonna just buy into something because I get swept up in the emotion of it. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. And we want to invite you to spend less than 24 of them with us on Alpha. Yeah, so we are big Alpha fans. And so again, we can't wait to continue Youth Alpha. So start this week, if you haven't started yet, to join, just text M514. Take your parents' phone or on your own phone. Um, text M514 to the number 514-400. Uh-oh, 514-700-4885. It's on the screen below, just in case you lost it. But we want all of you guys to sign up. It's gonna be awesome. 
And yeah. uh, I'm excited because we're continuing our series that we started yes. last week called Resilient. So Not right. just surviving this season, but thriving under pressure. And you have a time right now. So right now, get a coffee, get a journal ready because we're going to be launching into week two of Resilient. Get a pen, get some paper, write some notes because this will serve you well for years to come. Mm -hmm. God bless you guys as you continue the service with us. It was May of 1980 and it was a day from which she would never recover. Tragically, on a May day in California, Cindy's 13-year-old daughter was struck down and killed on the street by a drunk driver. Now that was something that you and I probably can't even imagine. The tragedy, the sadness, the sorrow. How does somebody recover from something like that? Well, Cindy Leitner took that pain, that incredible sorrow, that incredible loss from which she would truly never recover. And she used that to help thousands of other people. Cindy Leitner in the 1980s founded MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And in a 2004 study, almost 24 years after it was established, statisticians and researchers determined that over 300,000 lives have been saved just in the United States alone. In every state in the United States, MAD is thriving. In every province within Canada, there is a presence for MAD. And many countries of the world have taken the baton of this incredible, painful tragedy, this tragedy of Cindy losing her 13-year-old daughter. And again, thousands upon thousands of lives have been saved through policy changes, through awareness, through the lowering of the, the drinking uh, age and the, the blood level of alcohol. And so what we have to understand through this story and through our own stories as we're living through a global pandemic, as we're experiencing financial pressure and job loss and worries about the rising cases within Montreal, the rising continued cases in the world, we're under pressure, aren't we? And Cindy's story, and as we saw last week with the Apostle Paul, who was shipwrecked and beaten and thrown unjustly in jail just because he was a follower of Jesus, what we have to understand through our own stories and these other stories is that pain is inevitable in life, isn't it? Pain is inevitable. And what we want to see through this series called Resilient, this is week number two. So if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back last week as we kicked off the series by seeing the Christian chain reaction that's available for followers of Jesus. Now, we're not just going to be telling stories about people like Cindy Leitner and others who have done incredible work as a result of their pain. We don't want you just to try harder or to hear a message that you've got to grit your teeth a little bit longer and a little bit harder in order to succeed. In fact, what we're going to discover today is that pain is inevitable, but Jesus and the Christian faith allows us to reframe our pain. Let me say that again. In this world, Jesus said that we will face trouble. Pain is inevitable, but Jesus allows us to reframe our pain. What you're going to hear week after week is not just a feel-good message or an inspirational message. What we want you to hear above everything else is this, that you and I can't thrive under pressure until we reach out for help outside of ourselves. This is not an inside-out thing. This is an outside-in thing. We've got to reach out for help to the same Jesus who experienced pressure and injustice and death in order for us to reframe and find meaning in our pressure and in our pain. Isn't pain something that all of us want to avoid? Turn to a little bit more ice cream or some of us turn to another glass of wine or we, we numb ourselves with Netflix. We do all kinds of things to numb our pain. None of us like pain. Remember this hashtag, pressure bust a pipe. Pressure is something that all of us want to avoid, but again, in this world, we're gonna face pressures. We're gonna face relationship pressure, financial pressure, emotional pressure. We're going to finish with some disappointments in life, aren't we? And so what we want to see is give us ammunition, give us wisdom from God, and even more than that, the personal relationship with God that's going to help us in the high winds, that's going to help us in the hail. We need the everlasting God. Today, we're going to, we're going to turn the pages back of the scriptures, of the holy word of God, 
Back to the story of Genesis. This is the big, the book of beginnings. The word Genesis means beginnings, and it's the first book of the Bible. It's the book of beginnings. And we're going to talk about this character named Joseph. Just as we started with the founding of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, who's able to reframe her pain and bring meaning and, and helping other people, thousands of other people, we're going to see through the story of Joseph how his relationship with God, and only through his relationship with God, was he able to reframe his pain and to see the incredible results of a relationship with God in the middle of high winds, hail, and pressure. So if you're ready to dive in today, let us know in the comments below that you're ready, you're engaged, put away all distractions. If you've got other devices in front of you, high school kids and young adults and, and everyone else, let's engage for the next couple minutes. And let me push pause for a minute to say this. I want to thank our Next Gen Director, Leah Shadbolt, who's doing such a phenomenal job. Yay, Leah, with our kids and with our parents and especially recently with our M514 students. On Tuesday last week, we had the kickoff of Youth Alpha, something that we've been excited about for many months. And we had 15 high school students in Alpha. So I want to thank parents for casting the vision to your son or to your daughter. I wanna thank Danielle and Shayla and Divin and Leah for leading our students so well. Guys, I'm so thrilled that as we turn the page on the seventh year within City Church, this week was the celebration of our seventh anniversary. We are celebrating God's faithfulness. And I'm so encouraged that my son Sterling has a group of peers to grow up with, to grow their faith with, to face the pressures of life and to thrive under pressure. And so parents, way to go. High school kids, way to go. And especially to our leaders. Thank you to Leah and to all of our leaders for shaping into the next generation. We are so grateful for you. God bless you guys. All right. With that being said, let's dive in today as we see and hear a little bit from the story of Joseph. Last week, we learned from the example of Paul, this Christian chain reaction. Again, if you didn't watch that message, go back and, and hear the wisdom from God from his example. Today, we're going to learn from a man that he received a dream as a teenager. Joseph was the youngest brother of a dozen brothers. And he had this dream that one day that he would actually rule over his brothers. Now, perhaps unwisely, he shared his dream. Maybe that's one of those things he should have kept to himself. But he decided to say, hey, I had this amazing dream, mom and dad and, and brothers. One day, all of you guys are going to bow down and, and be underneath me. Now, I'm sure all the older teenagers and the young adults that were in his family were super excited that a 13-year-old was telling them that, weren't you? Well, Joseph predictably experienced some hard times because of that dream. But not just hard times. Joseph was beaten. He was stripped of his clothes. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was actually sold into slavery to an Egyptian military leader named Potiphar for 20 pieces of silver. So this wasn't just a sibling rivalry. Joseph was sold from the land of Canaan, which was the, the land known to be Israel later. He had to leave his way of life. He had to leave the Hebrew faith, which was the, the, the Jewish faith at the time. Listen to this. Joseph was the son of Jacob. He was the grandson of Isaac, and he was the great-grandson of the founder of Judaism, Abraham. Abraham claims as the ancestors all the Jews and all the Muslims today. And Joseph had the unique privilege of being the great-grandson of the patriarch of Judaism, the patriarch of of many, many, many nations. And yet that didn't spare him from trials. That didn't spare him from trouble. He was beaten, sold into slavery, and he had to leave his nation. He had to leave his religion. He had to leave his language. He had to leave everything behind and start over in a brand new way at the age, we believe, of 13. Many of you can identify with the pressure of moving to Canada or moving to Montreal, starting a new language, starting a new life, starting back in school, even though you already went through that process. It is so much pressure. It is so, so difficult. And Joseph walked through that. But we see later in the story that Joseph had God on his side. It says in Genesis chapter 39, verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph, so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. 
Even while he was in Egypt and even while he was serving another man, serving this man named Potiphar, this powerful man, God was with Joseph. Just because his his brothers and his family betrayed him, just because he was living in another culture with another language and other customs, because God was with him, Joseph prospered. But that's not the end of the story. Tragically, Joseph's story takes another downward spiral of a turn. He's accused of raping Potiphar's wife. He refused her advances, her advances and because of that embarrassment and that shame, she accused him of raping him and predictably, the husband was not so happy. And so he actually threw Joseph in the king's jail. And so Joseph found himself rotting in jail, in shackles, without freedom, without much food, without any freedom, without any semblance of normalcy. And again, everything that's happened to him at this point of his life had been things that he could not control. He had not done anything to deserve the treatment from his brothers. He did not deserve to get taken away from his homeland. He did not get deserve to be taken away from his job and taken away from this point of privilege under Potiphar's household. But yet, those circumstances and those people, well, they let him down. So, skipping down to verse 20, it says, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, listen to this, the Lord was with him. And he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. For 13 years, Joseph waited for his dream to come true. Joseph experienced injustice from his own family. Joseph lost his family. He lost his comfort. He even lost his freedom. And you would have thought that wasting away in jail, he would have turned bitter. He would have turned sour. He would have turned hard. But it says here in the word of God that Joseph never lost his confidence in God. Joseph never turned his back on his God. He continued to have confidence. And it says here that God was with Joseph when nobody else was. When his family had turned their back on him, when Joseph's dreams had flickered almost to a darkness, it says that hopeful phrase that, The Lord was with Joseph, even in the darkness, even in the isolation, and even in prison. God was with Joseph. We're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 41. Years have now passed where Joseph's been in jail, rotting away in jail. And he has... He's he's been speaking dreams during this whole time. He's given dreams to people that were fellow jailers of his. And so he has this reputation within the jail, not only of being a man of integrity, a man of positivity, a man of uplifting everyone else who predictably had a low spirit. Joseph, because God was with him, never took his eyes off of God and always looked up instead of looking down. It's an amazing quality of resilience that Joseph had. Why? Well, it's because... He never lost his confidence in his relationship with God. Let's pick up the story of Pharaoh now inviting Joseph to interpret dreams that were very significant. Pharaoh was the leader of Egypt. Egypt at that time was the most dominant nation, the most dominant empire, many people say, in history. And so this was a very privileged position that Joseph now finds himself in that he's talking to the most powerful person in the most powerful nation in the world. You can understand that Joseph would be nervous, but Joseph also saw an opportunity. Now, what would Joseph do with this opportunity? How would he make sure that he gets himself taken care of? How would he spin this to make sure that he gains freedom because of this request? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and nobody can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. This is what Joseph says. He doesn't puff himself up. Although everyone has turned his back against him, although Joseph has faced numerous injustices, although he would be forgiven for having the attitude, well, if no one's going to take care of me, I'm going to take care of me. That's how I would react, wouldn't you? But listen to how Joseph reacts with humility and again, pointing back to God in the middle of this very bleak situation. Joseph says, I cannot do it. 
but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Joseph interprets the dream. And what happens is that there's a famine in Egypt and there's a famine in that whole area of the world. So much so that the nation of Israel was going to suffer. Egypt was going to suffer. It was going to be a horrific famine. And it was going to lead to destitution and death for for millions of people. Unless there was an intervention. And so God graciously gives a dream to the leader of this powerful nation. But he withholds the interpretation. And only a man of God is given the key to unlock that dream. And that, of course, was Joseph. Now, I want to finish the story of Joseph by the miraculous turn of events. Joseph, because he interprets this dream correctly, Joseph, because he understands that this is a critical situation, Pharaoh turns to him and points him into the number two person in the whole Egyptian country. In a de facto way, Joseph becomes the second most powerful person in the world. This Hebrew suddenly finds himself as the most second most powerful person in the world, a trusted advisor to the most powerful man in the world. Talk about a turn of events. And later on, because of God's sovereignty, because God was always in control, because God was actually interested not only in saving all the Egyptian lives, but all of the nation of Israel's lives, his chosen people's lives, the plan that Joseph puts in place because of God's dream ends up saving all the food and and rationing the food so much so that there's enough food for them to survive. And so Joseph's brothers and their father find themselves coming into Egypt to get the only food supply in the known world. And that's all because Joseph had this plan based on this interpretation with God. And I want you to hear Joseph's last words of this story at least. To see through his grid, through his worldview, why he wasn't bitter. You would, again, you would forgive Joseph for being bitter. You would, you would expect him to be harsh towards his brother, all of his brothers. You, you would expect him to have a hard heart, to be hard and angry and to have all these unresolved issues with his family. But instead, listen to what Joseph says here in Genesis 45. For two years now, there have been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. Now listen to this phrase, but God, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and listen to this, to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here. In other words, it wasn't you and your treachery, your betrayal. It wasn't because you inherited 20 pieces of silver from my life that I'm here. But God, there's that phrase again, but God. If you have your, your Bible in front of you, circle that, highlight that. Aren't you excited for that two word phrase, but God? If it wasn't for God intervening in our lives, what hope would we have? If we're under pressure and we don't have a relationship with God, life is unbearable. In fact, last week we reminded you of that quote from, from Dr. Tim Keller, the pastor of Redeemer Church in New York City. And he said, suffering is unbearable unless we know that God is for us and with us. Joseph knew that firsthand. And so he said, but God, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. And he made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler over all of Egypt. What an amazing story of resilience. Why did Joseph have resilience? Well, the first thing is that his relationship with God helped him to reframe his pain so that he didn't just take it personally. He just didn't understand that that was random or that it was, that was a fait accompli, right? That was the end of life. He didn't look at things that way, but he understood that because he had a relationship with God, that but God understanding, that but God paradigm of life helped him to understand that for the follower of God, And in our context, for the follower of Jesus, there is always purpose in our pain. Joseph suffered unimaginable pain, emotional pain. His brothers sold him. he, He lost his relationship with his father. He lost his relationship with his friends. He lost his language, his customs. His whole way of life was twisted upside down. 
He was accused unjustly of rape. He was thrown in jail. He suffered incredible injustice, incredible pain and isolation and destruction in prison. And all of those things would be reasons for any of us to give up. So why was Joseph able to thrive in the middle of pressure? Well, he understood that when we have a relationship with Jesus, you and I, not only can we reframe our pain, but more specifically, we can see that through God, through a relationship with Jesus, that we can experience purpose in our pain. God never wastes pressure. God never wastes trials. As we see in the story of Joseph, his pain was used to save millions of people, not just a dozen people, not just even one nation, but the entire nation of Egypt and the many people in Israel that were around and other nations in the surrounding world were saved, were spared because God allowed a trial. God allowed pressure to come into Joseph's life and at just the right time, God planted a dream in a pharaoh and nobody else could interpret it but this man of God who never lost his confidence, who never looked down, but continued to look up in hope because he knew that as long as God is on the throne and as long as I stay tethered to that relationship, there is always hope. There is always purpose, even in the middle of pain. So be encouraged today. Be encouraged today. You might have gone through incredibly difficult things. You might have seen that pressure and people have let you down. People let Joseph down. People let the Apostle Paul down. People let Jesus down. In fact, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him. So you might have had a marriage that ended up in divorce because your husband walked out. Maybe you got linked up with a woman and just didn't work out. And that, that person who you thought you were going to get connected to, have this beautiful life with, now you're left with pain and now you're trying to recover as a single mom or as a single dad or just as trying to break, uh, amend a broken heart. You've gone through, maybe some of you have gone through job loss or are going through that right now. Some of you are, are dealing with a cancer diagnosis and it's affecting your entire family. And, and what God wanted me to say to you today is don't lose hope. With God, as a follower of Jesus, there is always purpose in your pain. And when God allows pressure into our lives, he builds up our character. He makes us more useful for other people. In Joseph's case, it was to spare two nations from death. Countless generations were saved. Millions upon millions of people's lives were spared because God allowed one person to go through injustice. So whether you're dealing with job loss or relationship loss, whether you're experiencing just the stress of the pandemic and the isolation and the fear of what's coming, all of us are there. We're all under tremendous pressure. But when you have a relationship with God that you can hold on to, know that God is in control and God is always with us and he's for us. Finally, it's really interesting when you examine the life of Joseph and you compare him to Jesus. Just like Joseph, Jesus had to, at an, early late, at an early age, he had to leave his hometown. He had to leave Israel and he also had to go to Egypt. Just like Joseph, Jesus was dearly loved by his father. They had a unique and a special bond, just like Joseph had with Jacob and just like Jesus had with his father. And yet they were betrayed. They felt injustice. They felt the sting of, of pain and betrayal and injustice, even from their own family. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, while Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph's injustice, Joseph's pressure, led to the saving of millions of people in Egypt and Israel, while Jesus' injustice and ultimately his death paved the way for the whole world, for every generation to be saved, not just temporarily, but for eternity. So as admirable as the story of Joseph is, we look to Jesus. And that's why I said earlier, for the follower of Jesus, there is purpose in the pain. Why? Because we're following the Savior who has the power of the universe, but he's also a Savior 
Let us walk through the death of the tomb, the darkness of the tomb. And on the third day, he rose to the resurrection. He saw the bright light of hope. And because of his resurrection, every follower of Jesus has the same hope, the same love, and the same power that rose Christ from the dead. So no matter what pressure you're under today, no matter what thing you're grieving today, maybe you're grieving the death, just like this mother that founded MAD so many years ago, maybe you're still dealing with that. And I don't know how you wouldn't be. Maybe you're dealing with this cancer diagnosis and you're losing hope, you're losing health, and you're discouraged today. Maybe you're wondering if you're ever going to meet somebody or if life will ever get back to normal. I want to encourage you today with this, that when you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, there is always purpose in our pain. Just like Joseph and just like Jesus, just like the Apostle Paul, God will allow pressure to come into our lives, not only to remake us from the inside out to be more like Jesus, but to make us more useful. If you're going through a depression today, be encouraged by this. Even though you're facing that darkness and that fatigue and that discouragement, there's going to be a come a time when you're going to be able to help maybe one, maybe dozens of other people that have gone through the same journey. If you've gone through the, the hardship of marriage, you understand how sensitive it can be, how quickly things can change. Well, God is going to use the hardships that you've experienced in your marriage to encourage other marriages, to encourage other husbands and wives to stick together and to work things out or to get counseling. And if you're going through cancer right now, if you're going through illness right now, God is going to use you. He's going to give you the resilience that you need to encourage people, to give them hope, and also to practically help them walk through their journey because nobody understands their journey quite like you do. So today, although we remember that pain is inevitable, with the relationship with God, He allows us to reframe our pain. Even though people and pressure have worn us down, we have to remember that God is with us right now. He's with us in the storm. He's with us in this season. He's with us in the year to come. He knows the answer to the future. He has the power. He has the love. He has the peace and the wisdom to give you and I in the middle of incredible pressure. If you don't have a relationship with God today, I want to encourage you that if you want to have hope after this pressure, in the middle of this pressure, this is a promise to every follower of Jesus, which means that if you hold out your hand to this Savior who died for you and rose for you, if you're willing to trade his pressure for you, he can raise you up and he can help you find meaning in your pain. He can heal you from the inside out. And the greatest thing is that he will walk with you through every pressure and every storm. And as you close your eyes on this side of eternity, when you have a relationship with Jesus, that will only continue and it'll only get better on the other side of eternity as you wake up in the arms of Jesus. There is always purpose in our pain. Aren't you encouraged today to see the story of Joseph? Aren't you encouraged today, last week, as we remember the example of the Apostle Paul? These are not just stories for us to be inspired by. It's a promise that God is with us in the storm and he will help us to give us purpose and meaning, not just to help one person, but to help dozens and maybe even thousands of people will be spared because you and I never let go of the everlasting God. Will you pray with me? As our eyes are closed, as we get ready just to still our hearts, this is a very important part of today's experience. And again, if you don't have a relationship with God today, you can pray. You can just say whatever words you want to say in your own words. But what you basically need to say is that, Jesus, I understand that I'm broken. I understand that I can't save myself. I understand that I've been selfish and I've hurt other people. I understand that I've even rebelled against your ways and your commands. Jesus, will you forgive me? Jesus, come into my life. Make me your follower. Make me a son. Or if you're a woman, make me a daughter of God today. And if you, if you mean that, if you pray that, at the moment you do, 
the Spirit of God will come into your life and He will give you that resilience. He will give you the kind of love that will never leave you. He will give you the kind of wisdom to make wise decisions. And the greatest thing, that no matter what happens on this side of eternity, He is going to stay with you and be with you and encourage you and empower you and strengthen you. And then one day, again, the arm of Jesus will never leave you. He will continue with you for eternity. So if that's you today, would you let us know on the, on the screen below, let us know that today you are making a decision for the first time to become a follower of Jesus. If you wanted the promise to know that God is going to give you purpose in the pain, He's going to comfort you and heal you from the inside out, that's a promise to every follower of Jesus. I urge you to make that decision today. And for the rest of us, today, let's recommit ourselves to trust God. It's hard to trust God when things are putting pressure on us. It's hard to trust God when the economy is uncertain. It's hard to trust God when we don't know where our next job is going to come from. It's hard to trust God when we're lonely and isolated at home. It's hard to trust God when we're depressed. It's really hard to trust God when we've lost a loved one. Today, I want to invite you, even though you can't see him, today I want to invite you just to open up your heart again to this God who was with Joseph when nobody else was. And he's going to be with you. Even if everyone else turns their back upon you, Jesus will walk with you and he will be for you. Thank you, Jesus, for experiencing horrible, horrific injustice and death so that we could receive ultimate freedom. Thank you for dying so that we could experience true life. Father, life is filled with so much pressure. Life is filled with people who will ultimately disappoint us and even hurt us. Life often doesn't go like we expect. So, Father, comfort those who are struggling today. Father, thank you for the powerful reminder today that you are always in control and you are always up to good. You see the whole picture and God, we have to confess, we only see a tiny window in a tiny slice of time. So, Father, we trust you. Father, remind us of the same love that you have for us as you had for Jesus. The same love that Jacob had for his dear son, Joseph. Finally, Holy Spirit, fill us today with your love and with your wisdom and with your resilience in the middle of pressure. Help us to thrive in pressure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you as you remember that God is with you and for you. And even in the middle of pain, that God will help you discover incredible purpose and meaning, not just to save the life of one, but I believe that God will use you to help to save the lives of many as you hold on to the everlasting God. Well, today's message was encouraging for me as I studied it, as I prayed through it, as I meditated on it. Isn't it amazing, though, anyone else could disappoint us and hurt us. Those circumstances will provide pressure on us, that God will be with us no matter what. What an incredible word. Today we saw how incredible the story of Joseph is, that even though everyone turned their back upon him, that Joseph never lost his confidence and never lost his connection with this everlasting God who has seen it all and has been through it all. One of the most difficult things that we can do in the middle of pressure is for us to continue to be generous, to continue to serve people. When we've been hurt personally, the most natural thing that we do is we're closed. We close ourselves up, we guard ourselves, and sometimes in a financial context, when we've lost a job or we're worried about what's happening in the economy, we tend to hold things even tighter. And if I wanna encourage you today, if you are a follower of Jesus, remind yourself of this, Though Jesus was free, he became enslaved so that you could go free. Though Jesus was fully alive, he experienced death so you and I could experience true life. And as a follower of Jesus, we're invited into that same spirit, that spirit of generosity that doesn't look to ourselves, but instead looks out to the people around us. As Joseph was able to spare the lives of millions by being faithful to God, you and I can help millions of people in our world. Yeah, I said it. Millions of people can ultimately get saved through a relationship with God. Generationally, I'm talking. We plant seeds today of God's financial blessings in our lives 
and God stewards them, multiplies them, and you'll be amazed one day, one day on the other side of eternity as we see all the evidence of how God has taken that trust and taken that dependence as we've invested his resources into the kingdom of God through the local church. God will shock and amaze us to see all the people who will end up in heaven with us because we were faithful to God. So on the screen right now, we're going to show you all the different ways that you can participate in generosity, whether that's through an interact transfer through an email, whether that's using our, our Subsplash Church app, you can find the app on our iTunes store or on your Android store. Look for City Church Canada, you can give that way, or you can go to citychurch.ca slash give. All those different ways are outlined on the screen in front of you. We wanna thank you for your generosity. Let's be praying for one another. As I'm talking today, many of you are going through difficult times. This may be one of the most difficult times in your marriage or in your finances or in your whole life. And we wanna let you know that we're with you. One of the benefits of being a part of a family, which is what the church is, is that we can encourage each other. So as the Holy Spirit brings someone to mind this week, would you call them? Would you text them? Would you FaceTime them? Just let them know that they're not alone, that they're loved, that you're with them, that God's with them. And together, we're going to walk through these dark times and we're going to get stronger on the other side so that we'll be able to serve and help even more people. God bless you this week. We're praying for you. We're with you. Let us know if there's anything that we can do to serve you this week. God bless you. joining us today for our City Kids Moment, a time just for you. So we are in a new month of September and uh, so we have a new memory verse. So for the first time, repeat after me. Are you ready City Kids? I don't know, you didn't really sound too excited. So let's try that again. Are you ready City Kids? Oh, that was awesome. All right, here we go. Remember, repeat after me. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. City kids, that was so good. And you know what? This is a verse that means a lot to me because my grandma would say it over and over to me and would pray it over me just, just that I would remember that God has a special plan for me. So I really love this verse and I hope you guys do too. Now, let's do it again, but this time I feel like I have a lot of energy and you probably do too, city kids. So this time, stand up because we're going to jump at every word while we're doing the actions. It's going to be kind of crazy, but let's try it. Ready? Let's do it all together. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> City Kids, that was so fun. Thank you so much for doing that with us. Now, we're gonna listen to a story with Ollie about a guy in the Bible named Joseph. And we're gonna learn that Joseph's life had a lot of really good times and a lot of really, really hard times. But we're gonna see how through it all, Joseph was still able to trust that God had a special plan for him. So, listen closely. Who? Who? Know what time it is? It's time to hear a story full of wonder. There's so much fun we'll have learning together. So let's go down, go down to the clubhouse with Holly and his friends. Let's go down, down, down to the clubhouse where wonder never ends at the Wonder Clubhouse. We miss you at the Wonder Clubhouse. We miss you. Oh, hello there, friends. Welcome to the Clubhouse. It's me, Kai. I'm so glad you're all here today. I was getting ready for the big ice cream sundae party at the clubhouse. These pictures are a step-by-step -step plan on how to make the most fantastic, most spectacular, most yummiest to the tummiest ice cream sundae ever. Step one, you get a bowl, a spoon, and a napkin, then you're ready to make an ice cream sundae. Step two, add ice cream to the bowl. It can be 
any kind of ice cream you want. Step three, add the toppings. Ice cream sundaes need lots of toppings. Step four, in what's the last thing we do with our ice cream sundae? We eat it, what a great plan. Ho, ho. It's Ollie. Hello, Kai. Ho, ho. What are you up to? Hi, Ollie. Well, I just finished putting together my plan to make the perfect ice cream sundae. Yes, that is an excellent plan. It's true. I have a story about another great plan for you. Just listen to this story. Just follow me through. Who? Who? Follow me through. I'm Casey, and I'm helping out at the Cupcake Food Truck. Do you want to see my latest, most delicious creation? Ta-da! These are my Sweet Dreams Cupcakes, because in today's story, we're going to talk about someone who had some pretty amazing dreams. If you're ready, on the count of three, yell, tell me a story. One, two, three! Tell me a story! Woo! This is Joseph. He was put in jail, even though he had done nothing wrong. Being in jail was hard for Joseph, but God had a different plan. One day, the king of all of Egypt, the pharaoh, had some dreams he didn't understand. They were about seven cows. Cows? What do cows say? Moo! You're right. <laughs> Dreaming about cows is funny. Wait, ooh, let's count the cows in Pharaoh's dream. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven! Great job! Seven cows. The pharaoh also dreamed about stalks of grain. Grain? We make bread out of grain. Let's pretend to have a snack. <gasps> mm, yum. Mm, yum! Pharaoh wanted to know what his dreams meant. And drum roll, please. He asked Joseph to help him. Hooray! Joseph was brought out of jail straight to the Pharaoh. He told Pharaoh that the dreams were from God, that Pharaoh needed to save lots and lots of grain because his people were going to be hungry and need it later. Pharaoh was so happy to know what his dreams meant that he gave Joseph a very special job. He put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. Years later, the dreams came true. People were hungry and didn't have food, so they traveled from all over to get grain from Joseph. Wow! God's plan was for Joseph to help all these people. God has a plan for us too. And God's plan is the best plan. Did you like the story? If you did, give it two thumbs up. Two thumbs up! <laughs> hey, Ollie, tell me, who has a plan for you? God has a plan for me. Yes, it's true. Now let's hear it from you. Tell me, who has a plan for you? God has a plan for me. That's the truth, friends. You better believe it. See you next time. So there's your story. It's all true. Joseph followed God's plan, and we should too. Thanks, Ollie. Goodbye to you. Who? Who? Wow, I loved that story. Joseph followed God's plan and helped so many people. I think I got the story. Did you get it? If you did, say, got it. Get it? Got it. Good. I'm excited about following this plan. It's going to be delicious. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.
come to Jesus and let him hold you in his arms.